Everybody, welcome to another installment of Show to Be with Mike G, the show of life, the show of London, Essex, traveling the world, Argentina, hospitality, and so much more with today's guest, Miss Charlotte Boise, the director of brand advocacy at William Grant & Son. She was recently in Austin for the Time Out Austin Bar Awards, recognizing the great cocktail and mixology hospitality culture that is thriving in Austin, Texas. Charlotte herself has had a massive career in this industry behind the bar, in front of the bar, and now in her largest role yet, leading a motley crew of brand ambassadors at William Grant & Son. So we talk about the awards, we talk about life, and we talk about Charlotte's journey into the limelight, into the media, and now in her most challenging coaching forward role yet. So without further ado, I hope you guys enjoy this great chat with Charlotte Voise. Most time I spent in Austin was when the W opened because I came down to help them open it. Oh, really? I didn't Especially know that. here doing training with the bartenders. I worked the first night behind the bar there, which was insane yeah. in a great way. A few it, years now, yeah? Yeah, it was a few years back, but it took me back to true bartending because, you know, we may still make drinks and do events, but that yeah. was, I was slinging drinks for hours to a very busy room. It was Does fun. it physically feel the same now a few years later? It physically feels harder now because <laughs> yeah. I'm not older. <laughs> But yeah, it's it. I miss it. And you you feel yeah. those same like emotions and the rush and the energy. It's nice to do every once in a while, but I'm definitely reminded that I don't know if I could still do it as a full time job. In a way, it's using your body for the first chapter, and using your mind for the second. Not to say they're mutually exclusive, but this right. latest kind of wave of what I would consider success for you as a you know the global head of brand advocacy, right, for William Grant and Sons. I mean, a major undertaking. Uh, in any way, is it more rewarding, less rewarding? Is it just an ev evolution of your skills that you've learned over the years? I think it's definitely an evolution of the skills that I've learned. Yeah. Um, you think my job now is as much to deliver through others and encourage others to perform as it uh -huh. is to still do my stuff. It's, it's a terrible sporting analogy from the UK, but it's like a player-manager role. No, that's exactly Does right. that work over em here? Empowering <laughs> your team. Yeah, right. but sometimes I still would you put myself on the pitch and, and do it. Yeah. So I still love that. So I'm very fortunate that I get to work with others and yeah. help them, but still do my thing every once in a while. You have a motley crew of personalities oh. that I'm sure you have to, let me say, wrangle. Yeah, yeah. Is that ever difficult? Is it more in intriguing and riveting because they're all so different? It is. It's honestly completely rewarding they're so great to work with and because they're so different i learn from each of them in different ways yeah. occasionally it's i wouldn't say it's hard but it's definitely um it stretches me in, in what ways does it stretch you um i'm an introvert oh, and really? yeah which is a surprise to most sure. people um and i don't think there's anyone else on the team that is <laughs> you've met some of them yeah and some of them are the extreme of extroverts so just from energy levels sometimes it stretches me and challenges me yeah. to be able to not sort of rise above, but, but rise out or stand back and get their attention and command them and, and lead them in the times that I need to. Um, the term natural born leader comes to mind. Do you think for you that you're stronger as someone that can rally the troops and help them le learn and grow? Or are you more getting the job done, filling those glasses one at a time? It, it, it's a little bit both. I'm learning to be more of a natural leader, but I yeah. still like to get in there and get my hands dirty and do things myself. I find it hard to delegate, mm. but I know that that is the next chapter. That is the evolution. So I'm working on that. Almost stepping uh, away from dribbling the ball. Right? Yes. It's but hard. I still it's like hard. To, it is hard. Yeah. Pulls you back in. 
does. But one thing I found is when I started, when the team started to grow and I started to lead or be a mentor, I quickly learned that I'd, I'd been so fortunate. I'd always had such a great time in this role. Yeah. And some of the others were starting to have growing pains or little problems or obstacles would yeah. come up. So immediately I was like, no, I can help them because I know how they can get around those problems. And that's when it became rewarding. So that's when I do like to do that. Giving back. Yeah. Empathy in a sense. Yeah, right? yeah. Empathy is my strength, I think. It always that's comes up on those charts you do as a spike. <laughs> what yeah. is it, the Myers-Briggs? Yeah, so all those kind of things. I think I'm a sociopath, I think, when I look back. Oh, okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, there are only 4% or something of the population of which I share traits. But I don't know oh. if that's good or bad. Does it make me special? Mm. Does it make makes me you special? Come Thank on. you. Okay, good. You I go. was going to say any social, but this is much better to be. No, no. Let's special. go with special. So this story, as we talk about this transition, lots to talk out. Talk about the Time Out Austin Bar Awards. Yeah. There's great stuff going in at Tales of the Cocktail. I try to keep talking to Dave out. I said about it, like one of those tickets available. That you know. Yep. The premier event usually. Mm-hmm. Actually, always at Tales of the Cocktail, and so much more. But for you, this story kind of begins. Did you grow up in Essex or did you grow up in London proper? Yeah, I grew up in Essex, so about 30 miles east of um, London. Yeah. My parents were from London but moved out to the suburbs when they had my sister and I. So that's where I grew up and went to school. Um, then moved to Brighton for university yeah. um, with a year out in Spain, in Barcelona. Studied then, abroad, ultimately. Yeah. yeah. What kinds of industry were your folks in? Um, my mother is a graphic designer. Really? And my dad was always in insurance. Yeah, so big, big London left trade. brain, right brain. Yeah, probably, yeah, actually, that's true. When you think yeah. about it, do you feel like you embody traits of both of those things, being able to think analytically, but also being able to be creative? Yeah, more on the creative side. Yeah. Those that know me well <laughs> would definitely agree with that. Um, I'm a dreamer. I like the creating, uh, that kind of side of, of my work. Yeah. The, the admin and the organization and the dotting the, the uh, I's and crossing the T's, not so much. Yeah, the necessary evils, yeah. the insurance side. But it's an 80-20, let's say, maybe, instead it, of... It totally is, and again, I'm fortunate for that, so I'll, I'll take it. To have both, yeah. <laughs> so the... Because I always try to go back. Many of the great personalities and success stories in this industry, they have some roots in hospitality. You know, maybe mom was a career waitress. Maybe dad mm. was behind the bar. But for you, when you think about this spark of hospitality, because that's what you... Did you stutter inter, international hospitality? Yeah, at that's Brighton, right. right? Yeah. University of Brighton? Where did you where did you get that wise idea to go and pursue that? My first job when I was at school was, you know, a weekend waitress in an Italian restaurant. Yeah. And I worked with a lady there. She was from Rome, Pam, tiny but fierce and <laughs> oh, tiny Italian women. Tiny and fierce. Very, very fierce. Yes. Very Italian, but the embodiment of hospitality and I think she taught me not necessarily by sitting down and explaining, but yeah. just by by being her. And I just, I loved it and I enjoyed it. And I enjoyed the pace and the social aspect of it. Yeah. Um, and then I never really knew what I wanted to do academically, but I enjoyed that and I wanted to travel and I wanted to learn languages. So the course that came up of international hospitality management seemed to tick the boxes and seemed to be a good thing to do for the moment. Sure. Until some other idea came along. Which some other dream. Never did. Yeah. Right. <laughs> When it comes to the people aspect of it, we've talked about kind of how you manage the team and you embrace those wild personalities at times, but people can be really tough to be around. For you, do you take the good with the bad? Do you appreciate people with all of their flaws and all of their great characteristics? Um, I try to, but I think the, the thing about hospitality is, and it's a difficult thing to explain, but y when you're there in a role to help people or serve mm -hmm. them or provide them with the food and drink that they've ordered or however you describe it, 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 it the roles are kind of set so it, it's actually there's something quite nice in doing that very well even if people aren't always appreciative of it interesting um, and I and you learn that very early on in the hospitality business you know you treat everyone with respect you treat everyone well and even if it doesn't always come back to you there's something grounding and rewarding in, do, in treating people that way for your own sake when you think about the physical barrier that really does create a nice mm -hmm. obstacle and a, a barrier, and a social one in a sense, right? Yep. Does that help with that, that dynamic? The, to know that they can't cross that bar. You have some parameters in place. 
yeah it definitely does help um physically and then again small things you learn in the beginning just the art of conversation and how to wrap things up quickly yeah. and either change subjects or jump on to someone else who's who's also waiting for your attention so you have to be quite skilled at doing that without upsetting people or appearing to be cutting them off or, or moving away you got to be political don't you yeah diplomacy that's right mm. do you find that those kind of traits stay on the job and then when you come home it's slightly different for your own personal relationships uh, in my own personal life, no. Um, I, that's how I like to treat everyone. Yeah. Um, I don't have much confrontation in my life. I'm quite a placid person. Yeah. So is my, my boyfriend. You know, we have a, a lovely relationship. Same with my family. So um, I, th I think that's the way I am and, and how I like to treat people. And um, I guess I have parameters of, of things I avoid. Right. Yeah. How often do you get back to London? Or to Essex to visit the family, assuming yeah, they're still there. Yeah, about four or five times a year. Oh, that's brilliant. Which is not, not too bad. It's still um, very rare to see one's parents, but it's, yeah. it's pretty good for me living in New York to get back there, you know, four or five times a year. It's nice. Has the dynamic changed recently? It seems like I've been to London many. That's one of the only cities I've visited multiple times. Absolutely love it. Yeah. I have this weird kind of, I feel very connected to the Brits. I don't know why. Right. Maybe it's the blood somewhere inside of me. I'm not really sure. But a lot of interesting and violent, tumultuous things have been going on. Yeah. Do you notice that the dynamic of that city has changed at all in the wake of this violence? Um, it's difficult, you know, because London's been through so much. First of all, it's been there for a lot longer than a couple any world American wars, right? cities. <laughs> yeah, and, and even, you know, when I was growing up, my father would work in the city in insurance during, you know, the IRA bombings, oh, and wow. which, you know, looking back obviously was was terrible but at the time it was just sort of something that happened in a big city or at mm. least that's what i thought so not to play anything down no, that's happened not. recently but i do feel like london is a city that you know has to i guess or has come to be able to absorb these things and somehow just carry on regardless yeah. i mean it's that sort of cliche of the british stiff upper lip right you just keep 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 but calm and carry on but it's it's what london does yeah um, and I'm not back there really often enough to, to really feel it because I don't really live there anymore. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it's pretty unfortunate what's happening now. It's, you know, as an American, I'm the, I'm the stand-in now to represent America right okay. now in this conversation. <laughs> it's really nice. It's, we're not really like that. We don't want to be calm, you know? We, have you noticed that change in what is maybe an eccentricity in the West? in America where people, they, they're not that calm. They're not necessarily that focused to move forward. They're a little more rash. Yeah, definitely. I think it's a difference in culture. Yeah. Um, and again, I mean, not to get too into it, but if you look at the history of the UK and, you know, the British Empire and all of that stuff, you know, we've done a lot of <laughs> interesting and, and, and negative things around the world. Yeah. And, and we've sort of dealt with some of those coming back. And so... I, I, th I think maybe it just speaks to the maturity, literally, of the right. two countries. Not in any way, um, I mean, that derogatory to America. No, of course. But well, it's a life cycle to it. Yeah, There's I think, you know, the Britain or England or London has just been through so much, so many times. That yeah. There's a, just a, such a, a thick, like, makeup of the city and the people and the culture mm. um, that it takes more, I think, to rattle us if you look back in history and see what's all of the stuff that's happened. Maybe that's it. I think you're right. We'll get rattled soon enough. I mean, we get challenged. I think that we need to mature too, you know? And it's a, just an interesting time with you being on the road. Yeah. And yeah. many cities, many different personalities beyond the great portfolio and those guys, mm -hmm. right? But have people changed at all for you in the past few years? Or is it kind of the same thing as it ever was in America? Um, it's interesting because although I travel a lot and quite sporadically and, and always to new and different places, I do have that cycle of events that I do every year so there is quite a constant which allows me to measure year on year yeah. you know I'm always in Aspen in June I'm always in New Orleans in July there's certain events that allow me to think oh how has this changed from a year ago yeah um, the industry has changed I mean we're all the sort of initial generation that I started with here in the US 11 years ago you know has all we're all 11 years older so there's a whole right. new generation of bartenders and professionals and ambassadors coming through and I think that's where I see the most change in people yeah. and attitudes, um, good, bad, and ugly. 
do you think the concept of brand education or brand advocacy, as in the wake of what things have maybe happened over at Diageo and how they've restructured, do you see that core role also changing, the way in which a brand consultant advocate, whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. engages with people? Yeah, definitely it's changed. I mean, in the beginning, there were a few of us, and I include myself as one of the first few in the U.S., and our job was to educate because there wasn't much information out there. There wasn't yeah. much knowledge about spirits production or categories or the history of cocktail culture. So we spent a good four, five, six years preaching that or yeah. spreading the word or enlightening people. Um, and then it changed. People did get educated. So brand advocacy or education kind of became a little less serious and it was more about this is the personality of my brand. Come yeah. have fun, engage, fall in love with our brands. There wasn't as much need for education. Not, not everywhere. That's a really good point. There's, it, maybe it correlates to the access of technology, right? Uh, yeah. People being self-starters. They said, well, mm -hmm. I want to learn how to distill gin. I will just read about it now. Whereas yep. before, you're right, it was almost like an iron curtain yep. on the information. Do you think that that creates better unity and ambition in the industry? Or does it cause more doubt and uh, jadedness? Well, hopefully it's a good thing, right? Yeah. Hopefully um, higher levels of education, whether they've come from a brand ambassador seminar or from something that's been researched in a book or on the internet, hopefully that's all good. Yeah. Um, it really just depends on the integrity and the expertise of the person giving that education. Um, I'm certainly the word brand ambassador has been used a lot wider and deeper than we might use it, for example, throughout yeah. the industry. Um, and not everyone's had the luxury of going to the distillery and learning spirits production like the ambassadors at William Grant & Sons do. Not yeah, everyone. David just came back from Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky group, right. you guys. Yes. Charmed. Very yes. charmed group. Yeah. Do you think that people, when you talk, there's a concept called star tending. Yeah. Well, we're all very self-centered or can be. And you've put in all this time to learn slowly but surely, have accolades as bartender of the year in the UK, start many different projects, come over to the States with Hendrix Gin, all these great milestones. Do you think that people are not as willing to maybe work the long road now? They want that impulsive, instant gratification. I don't know if it's about what people are prepared to put in or not. I think it's that they've seen others come and ah, quickly get it. So yeah. it, it's not necessarily that they're not willing to put in the time or that they're lazy in any way, yeah. but I think the industry has exploded. It's, it got very exciting very quickly. Opportunities were ripe. And I think that, again, if you were just getting into this business, you're like, great, well, I want to be on TV and I want to have a book and I want to have a show and I want to have a trail of bar tools yeah. with my name on them because um, it was happening for a lot of people. So the carrots were dangling, I think. It makes sense. Lower or... <laughs> yeah, no, they're definitely. Or, it yeah. seems more accessible. Yes, like, exactly. Yes, well, just the guy that lives just the street, down the street from me can yeah. obtain this success. Perhaps I can too. It's flatter. It is. Right? And also, all of a sudden, you had... It wasn't just... There weren't, it wasn't just cocktail culture in three or four cities in America. Yeah. It wasn't just New York, San Francisco, Chicago. It's now everywhere. So every city kind of needed or still needs their hero or their star yeah. to sort of help you know um, escalate the the culture i hadn't thought about it like that yeah. that does make a lot of sense the neighborhood needs someone to rally behind they yeah. always do austin does houston dallas we have massive markets right but everybody's got to have their patron saint yeah you know they really so do. maybe there was a need for it i think so i had never thought about that structurally mm. or sociologically like that before. yeah well it feels like one of the entries or the introductions into William Grant & Sons was this gig you had with Hendrix Gin. Mm -hmm. Would you say that gin just generally changed your perspective on spirits? What was kind of your propensity to work in that category? Yeah, um, I always liked gin. It was always intriguing and interesting. Um, yeah. You know, whether a gin has four botanicals, like something classic like Tanqueray mm -hmm. or 11 like Hendrix or even more like some others, there's so much in there that can come out through aroma and taste. And, you know, we used to do these seminars called Botanical Bartend in Jim Ryan and I, where we take all 11 botanicals of Hendrix plus cucumber and rose and get 13 bartenders and give each of them a botanical as their muse. And then mm. they would create a cocktail. And that in itself, 13 different drinks inspired by one gin. 
and that just shows how much depth and diversity just one gin can have. That's so right, yeah. I was always attracted to gin for those reasons. It can be a hundred thousand things all at once. It gives you, it is to you what you are in the moment. Are yeah. you upset? Are you sad? Maybe right. you want that dark, brooding mm -hmm. juniper note. Or you can think of it in the opposite way. It's nice and it's very beautiful on the nose, citrus and all of this. So, yeah. so maybe gin is a more pensive and introspective <laughs> spirit. Yeah, I just like the versatility of it. You're right. It can be anything to you depending yeah. on your mood or depending on the concept of the bar you're working on or depending on the food plate that you're pairing with. There's, yeah. just, there's so much inspiration there already to work off. I like that. Yeah. It's, there are a lot of categories that are emerging that way now. You yes. know, you guys have Montalobos, which is just a beautiful mm -hmm. mezcal that has so much u unique qualities from the earth. Yeah. You have, obviously, Ancho Reyes, the original, mm -hmm. and then the Verde, which yep. we'll talk about that being up for one of the best awards. I mean, best product. That's an insane thing. It's one of the greatest concoctions ever, by the way. Yeah. That one, don't usually drink before 12 p.m. That might be the exception with some eggs. Oh, wow. Okay. You know? yeah, that's, I can that's see how that. Yep. Meaty it is. Spice. But talking about your shift from behind the bar to the brand ambassadorship in that role, yeah. did you learn? You had, it seems like, this great skill set of communicating with people, connecting, being diplomatic. What did you learn from that chapter, being the Hendrix, the face ultimately of Hendrix Gin in the States? Um, I loved my time with Hendrix, um, obviously still work with the brand, yeah, but yeah. I, I think you learn about brand embodiment and it, I think my time there has obviously enabled me to help the other guys, mm. um, the rest of my team, because they are now brand ambassadors for one single brand. So I can take from my experiences and simple things like staying passionate about the same liquid Every again day, and again. Right? Yeah spring summer fall you know every year and how to keep being inventive you know some of our brands like Malagra will have six expressions the single malts obviously have lots of different variants yeah. but whether it's Reka or Montelobos or Hendrix itself you know how do you stay in love with and monogamous creative, in right, a sense right that's a great but point. still super excited about it because that's the whole point of the ambassador to exude excitement so that others it's supposed to be contagious right yeah. infect others with that passion so I think that's something that I can draw from, from my time with Hendrix. And what? the inspiration would come from different seasons, different cities I traveled, you know, yeah. from, from many places. Perhaps things that you, I'm really interested in, obviously gin in itself is inherently inspirational. There's so many different kinds of textures and flavors and nuances. If we step outside spirits, and obviously you've created many cocktails, and I've seen many episodes of the proper pour in which you're there kind of constructing these cocktails, what inspires you is there art or music that you go to literature that you go and you say these are things that I can always dive into that somehow I come out a little bit more inspired um, I think literature yes maybe movies but older stuff yeah. I think like dipping into different eras I find inspiring what's something that I love film so any chance I get to talk about it I will yeah. always think what's a film that you can always go back to that always enlivens you or inspires you i mean like even the old charles dickens stories yeah. and those that have been turned into film mm -hmm. um more specifically probably for gin and hendrix right because it just fits that british eccentricity yeah. um and there's always details there that you can pull out i mean as you know well know with cocktail law we always go back in time right the inspiration Absolutely. is rarely from the future we're just so discontented with the present aren't we <laughs> <laughs> i know so you know whether it's a christmas carol or some of those good old like pickwick papers where yeah. it's the book or the, the the um movies that have been made those kind of things i think would always inspire me whether it's just the name of a character and then you can you can delve in and speculate as to what he or she might have mixed up yeah. when they got home or it's, it, I like that, too. It's like vicariously living through those characters. Yeah, exactly. That's what uh, method acting is, ultimately, you know? Yeah, Diving in and just learning so much about the person that you're kind of becoming. But we're talking about a genre of cocktail which has the yeah. same kind of place and culture as theater does. Yeah, people know? love the stories and they love the, you know, what's behind the name or how did you come up with this? Yeah. Sort of kind of like your question now. So anything that you can enrich in that with. Um, I like it. I, I Oliver Twist, I go back to that, but there's not a lot of drinking in that. It's just a lot of porridge. So it's yeah, like, <laughs> it's, a, it's true. It's a different. Well, 
How long have you been in this current role with William Grant Sons as kind of the director of brand advocacy? Yeah, it's, so it's been about 18 months, coming up on two years now. Wow. Yeah. And this partnership with Time Out Awesome yep. while we're here, right? So this is actually lovely. The Contemporary Museum on mm -hmm. 7th and Congress. We have these beautiful, like, kind of Art Nouveau fans that are still functional. They look good and they're functional. Yeah, thank goodness. Definitely not the case in most museums, right? They'd have right. a chair we couldn't sit in or something yes. like that. But what, and Time Out is relatively new to Austin. However, mm -hmm. it's been around the globe. I used it a lot when I was in Shanghai trying to find places, Swing Low, for oh, example. Cool. Yep. And where did this partnership kind of emerge? Yeah, so um, we were talking with Time Out for a while and, um, you know, they had done the bar awards before and obviously bartenders, bars, that's our world. We love um, communicating with the trade and, and just being a part of that whole world. Yeah. And their option came up to support the awards. Um, and I'd been to a couple of events, you know, prior years, not when we were sponsoring. Yeah. Um, and it just felt like a really good fit. You know, bartenders are at the heart of what we do. Uh, we love to throw events, you know, We've got this great team of ambassadors, which we can divide and conquer and, and bring these events to life and really just help connect once again the bartenders to our brand. So yeah. it felt like a really good fit. Austin is no uh, slack either. Brilliant spot no. <laughs> to come in and do it, right? No, it's been, it's been fantastic. I mean, this is our fifth city now for the mm -hmm. awards. That's amazing. Um, what are some of the others you guys have? So we started with New York, mm -hmm. Los Angeles, um, and then Chicago, Miami, and now Austin. Amazing. So, yeah, it's a good, good, strong five cities representing the U.S. It's not bad. Yep. Do you have a dedicated personality or ambassador for each of the cities? So I know yep. Vance is here with Jambui tonight, but yep. what about Chicago? Was it? Well, I mean, David lives in Chicago. David I guess was, Allardyce yeah. is in Chicago, but also Mattias on Hendrix. Oh, cool. So okay. the two of them hosted there. Uh, Sebastian um, Debonme on Monkey Shoulder, Monkey Shoulder and Jaime yeah. on Milagro oh, are down cool. in Miami. See, yep. this makes sense. You're casting. Oh, yeah, You're and then we did Eric events. was in New York, yeah. Eric Anderson on Hendrix. He did a great video, too, that they filmed with him and Mitch from Glenn Fiddick. Amazing. Uh, yeah, so we've divided and conquered. And, and Los Angeles, we had Trevor. Of course. And Mark. Inspiring so. actor. Oh, my Trevor goodness. Trevor Snyder, right? Yeah, party and a, party and a person. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's... But yeah, it's been good. It's interesting. You did, we talked about Trevor for a second. Yes. Trevor is good at something that he told me you were good at. This is not a weird thing. Okay. Turning into a pumpkin. Oh, <laughs> I'm very good at that. <laughs> is it a hard balance to strike? I mean, you are one of the most notable icons in this industry, having been on Iron Chef, having a webinar, you know, this, these episodes on YouTube. I mean, you got to balance it. Yeah. You got to balance it, right? Yeah. You have to know your own limits, and everyone's different. And that's, again, something I learned early and something I try and, and give advice on. You have to know how far you can go, whether it's, uh, sleep, diet, exercise, that's my sort of holy trinity, if you will. Yeah. You need to know what you need in order for yourself to be happy, healthy, and to be good at your job, because our jobs take a lot of energy. Um, and there's never any shame on, you know, leaving the party oh, when it's done, yeah. leaving early, turning into a pumpkin, disappearing at midnight, um, if, that's what, if that's what you need to do. Um, it is all about balance. I mean, these jobs are fun. I want, we want to do them for more than a couple of years. Right. And we have great longevity in our team, which is, I think is a testament to the culture that I like to set, which is, you know, zero tolerance for peer pressure. Everyone needs to be able to have their time to keep themselves healthy. What's something that maybe people that feel maybe afraid of approaching the topic of health, what do yep. you think is like a simple thing that anybody could do going to better early eating well, whatever, but for you, what's the yeah. thing that you think, like, just the linchpin of being able to be healthy on the road? Uh, exercise every day. Yeah. There are people that are sort of, well, I'm traveling, so I can't go running. It's like, you know, that's the, hotel the one workout, thing you man. can do. Yeah. yeah. You always pick a hotel with a gym or here, is it the Lady Lake Trail? Uh -huh. Yeah, Lady right? Lake, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, know where you're going to work out and just schedule your week accordingly. You, you know, you might think, well, I have to take this conference call. How about well, I have to actually work out yeah. and then, you know, make it a priority. Schedule time for it. Put it in your eye call. Yeah. That's the greatest thing to do. Block off meetings if you can, just to take an hour to yourself to get that zen that you need from yeah. being connected well, and, to your and body. And whether it's meditation or running or yoga, exactly. or swimming, everyone's different. Again, right. whatever you need to stay healthy because you, you can't get that back. Well, I think that as to your point, when you talk about going back behind the bar, it gets tougher and tougher to do mm -hmm. these physically strenuous things. Yes. And if you're relying more on your mind in your latter years and your the latest careers of or chapters of our career, yep. you gotta take care of that too. Yep. Sleep. 
yep. water all of these things. Yep. Is it difficult for you ever to maintain that balance, or? Uh, it can. I mean, it, it can be hard. If you look at your routine for the week, and you sort of think, "All right, this, this is going to be a tricky few days." Today, for example, was difficult for me. At a five o'clock start, you know, yeah. I've come straight here. I'll go straight back to my hotel tomorrow. I have another early flight. So I like to also look at my week and see how I can balance it in the week. Um, but if there is a day that's busy and you don't get to work out or sleep enough, mm. I'll literally schedule it for the next day or the, the coming days. You have to make it a priority. Yeah, it's amazing. It's that simple. I, I completely agree. Eating is a massive part of it. Yep. Drinking leads to eating and it doesn't yeah. have to. You always have to really watch yep. out. Yep. Your body's always trying to recover. Yes. Well, I have a couple questions left for you. We'll talk about Tesla Cocktail here in a second. There's, I was curious about, curious about this piece because I remember way back, I think this was 2005, I, before I was even in this industry, just got out of college, I saw these two mixologists on this show called Iron Chef. <laughs> and I was in love with that show. I love cooking. I love flavors. And I remember you from way back then. So, like, in a way, this is the greatest fucking thing, like, to be able to sit <laughs> and talk to you. But the question is... You've managed to evolve as a media icon. I, it, uh, we'll use that loosely. I know that maybe that's an inflation, but I think that's apt. Do you like the attention? Do you like being at the center of a room that's looking at you and counting on you for all the answers? Yeah, I do. I love it. I love being on stage. <laughs> yeah. There's nothing I love more than giving live seminars and, and, and doing that. It's, and it's funny because I am introverted. Um, and people often mistake that for me, meaning you don't like attention. Yeah. Uh, but it's not. It's more about how you recharge, right? That's right. So, no, I love it. And that's why I still do this. Were you ever an aspiring actress? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many bartenders in our industry that were. That's yeah. why I say it quite quickly. Let no, them do no, it, right? I'm yeah. not very good at that. I like to, you know, I, I really enjoy talking about things that I know about because yeah. that, that's where confidence comes from. Um, but no, I love it. It's a thrill. It's fun. It's not a bad gig. Yeah. You have a good team. You get to be Great on stage. Team. Yes. You have the notoriety, the expertise. It's a pretty good gig. Yeah, pretty happy. Does, do you ever kind of think about, all right, outside of this industry, do you think about starting a family? Do you think about that piece of things too? Is it, that seems like that'd be a very difficult balance to strike in addition to such great travel and all of that. Yeah, I, I do think about that. And again, when, that, when it's the right time to do so, that becomes the priority and everything else sort of yeah. falls into place. Um, and again, they've got some great friends and peers in the industry who have done just that. So uh, I don't think it's impossible. One phase at a time. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Well, so here in a few weeks, we have what is the premier event globally for the cocktail industry, yeah. cocktail culture, all of it, cocktails of the cocktail. And I always look forward to the party every year. Of course, I'm still bugging Dave about the tickets. But <laughs> one of the great pieces of the story this year, Trevor's up for best. Brand ambassador, right? He's one of the top four. He made the top, the top ten. Ah, top yeah. ten. Oh, I yeah. hope I'm not pushing this. Didn't, didn't quite make the top four, but well, look, not this year. Still, though, yes. being in top ten is insane. It's and, phenomenal. Yeah. And Chorreas Verde being one of the most notable yep. products, best new product of the mm -hmm. year. Yep. When you go down there with this sense of pride, what mm -hmm. kinds of things are left to do? It's so evident that you guys are making a big splash. What, what is there? How, how do you even top that when you go down there? Well, I think, you know, Tales of the Cocktail is a great reminder of how dynamic the industry is. And we do spend a good six to eight months preparing for Tales. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we put in all of our new ideas, everything that's up and coming and, and share that. But you, there's so much more out there. So it's such a good networking opportunity and learning opportunity for us yeah. to see all of these new ideas. And what are the new questions that the bartenders are asking? And that in itself, you literally come away with just as big of a to-do list or yeah. an ideas list for next year. Because you see sort of there is new topics that people are passionate about or have questions about or want to get into. Or maybe there's new sort of skill gaps that we can help fill. So just when you sort of think we've done it all, you'd think by now that there's always more stuff coming through. Going to the public and finding out yeah. what they need. Yeah. Well, not that anyone's asking me, but because I love spicy food so much and I do love anchovies verde so much, if ever there's a habanero version, oh. that may blow some people away, but you could, it would be orange. I don't remember how you say orange in Spanish, but... Naranja. Well, yes, some, yeah. something to that yeah. degree, right? So... I don't know. I'm no, just saying. That's a good idea. I would mm. really enjoy that. 
And if you need someone to R&D it, it would be my pleasure oh, to just go down and work with Yvonne to, to make that happen. I'll pass that along, yeah. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you so much. Well, I have one final question for you, mm. and I'm not sure how you'll answer this. Sometimes I can tell, sometimes I can't. But you are at your favorite bar in the world, wherever that may be, sipping whatever you're in the mood for, but some great spirit. And you can have a conversation at that bar with someone living or deceased. Who would you love to just sit there, share a drink, and a conversation with? Hmm. Well, it is a question I've been asked before, and it's, I'm never quite sure how to answer it. Um, I'm going to go with Che Guevara. Really? Which is probably wildly surprising um, and potentially offensive to some people, but I was always very intrigued by him um, as a person who set out with quite a clear, simple mission that got very complicated quite quickly. Yeah. Um, when, when I lived in Argentina for a couple of years, which is where he's from, I just started reading all of the journals he wrote and uh, got down a bit of a rabbit hole. So he, he left too soon. Yeah. It would be good to, uh, to perhaps pick his brain. Do you think you guys have anything in common? Um, possibly. Again, I, I know that history sort of has shown what happened with, sure. uh, with everything that he started, but... I do believe that his original intention was to help people and do good. So I hope that that's something we have in common. I think so. It seems like you've sought out to do good and you've done a brilliant job of it so far. No signs of slowing either. <laughs> I really appreciate you taking the time out, Charles, to chat with me on this. What in summer, this is usually intolerable up here. It's quite nice but it's up here. It's really, really nice up yeah. here. We get to look at us and smell this wood. And I can't wait for the Time Out Bar Awards, Austin, yep. tonight. Check it out and see who wins. Some fellow friends, I surely hope. Yeah, super excited for Wonderful tonight. Wonderful chatting. Today. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Well, there we have it, Miss Charlotte Voise, the Director of Brand Advocacy at William Grant & Sons. We're sitting atop the contemporary Austin. A nice Austin afternoon weather-wise. There's a nice breeze sitting on a rooftop, getting all those city sounds, as I'm sure you guys heard. And Chatting about the Time Out Austin Bar Awards 2017, a great partnership between William Grant and Sons and Time Out Austin, and just a great celebration of what Austin has become. Charlotte talks about setting up and helping launch the W Hotel and how things have changed in just those few years. It was great getting to hear about Charlotte's story. You know, I remember somewhere in 2005, these two mixologists, quote unquote, were on this show that I like to watch called Iron Chef. And the fact that this all kind of circles back and ties back and finally get to sit down and chat with Charlotte all these years later, it is a really, really great experience. I feel very privileged to do so. She's had such a decorated career in this hospitality industry, and I cannot wait to see what she's up to next. So thank you, Charlotte. Thank you, Time Out Austin. And thank you for listening to Show to V with Mike G. No matter how sad you are because Silicon Valley has come to an end for yet another season, or if you're thinking, I wonder if the missed show reboot based on the movie Stephen King novel will be any good, you guys tell me, please keep dancing.